Welcome, NEC Hoops fans, to the NEC on the Run Hoops podcast. We're on the NEC Overtime Pod. This is the fourth episode of the 22-23 season. We're at the halfway point. Plenty to talk about today. I'm Ron Ratner. I'm with Ryan Peters. As you see on the screen, you can find him on Twitter at Pioneer underscore Pride. He's also one of the great uh, writers on the NEC Overtime blog. Ryan, let's get going. Let me set the stage a little bit. Uh, this was what we're starting to see is some tightening at the top and some major banding in the middle of the NEC standings. No more unbeatens. Uh, FDU lost two games at home this week. But the fir but first, as we head into our three-point shot, what I think we need to talk about is a challenger for the top spot that we weren't sure that would be the case when the season started in Stonehill. Yeah, they had the most impressive weekend overall with two victories on the road after a two game losing streak and they take care of business against LIU. But I mean, that second half against FDU on Sunday was so impressive. It, you know, it went 10 consecutive possessions without scoring in the middle of that game. They were stuck on 19 points for what seemed like forever. But then Isaiah Burnett got a, a layup with about 18 minutes left in the second half. And then the team just took off. I mean, they were seven of 10 from deep six of nine from inside the inside the paint and it was remarkable how they just flipped the light switch there and blitz FDU out of their gym. You know, think about this. You know, Shamir Johnson was just dynamic in that game, you know, over 20 points. He made seven buckets, four of them threes. He was getting downhill as well and finishing in the lane. And just a really impressive road victory to get Stonehill back up to five and three in league play. And now they're within striking distance to first place. A remarkable job in the first year of Division One for Chris Kraus. Well, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. We saw Merrimack, what they did in their first season in uh, transitioning to the NEC. Stonehill at five and three. I'm not sure we had that on our dance card at the beginning of the year, but I think we're all starting to believe now because they never seem to get phased by the situation. We saw Shamir Johnson catch absolute fire yesterday, uh, but it then moved to the rest of the team and Josh Mack hit a big shot and they did it in a game where Andrew Sims didn't have his best stuff. Yeah. And then Zagorowski made some free throws and, you know, they just have that veteran leadership. And so when you have six guys who are seniors in that team, who've been through the wars in division two, it's no surprise that the Skyhawks are now three and one in NEC road games. Well, we have a great story brewing up at Stonehill. If anyone was worried that Wagner wasn't going to come back for a one and three start, put those worries to rest right now. Three wins in a row for the Seahawks. Home sweep this week. They looked really good um, in both games this week. Defense, and now the offense is starting to click a little bit. A little home cooking for Wagner, taking care of business at the Spiro Center. And they played to their identity like they have been all year when they've had these uh, positive outcomes, holding both teams, Sacred Heart and Central Connecticut, to a combined 0.86 points per possession, 16% shooting from three and you know I know defense rules the day for for Merriman, for Wagner there's no doubt but they got some offensive performance as well Ramir Moore played like an all-conference first teamer yesterday scoring 19 points he had big shot after big shot you know Sacred Heart cut it to three late and then Ramir Moore just hits this tough mid-range jumper really nothing Sacred Heart could do to extend their lead to five and Sacred Heart never got any closer Rob Taylor, we're going to talk about him later, but he's been fantastic, 36 points over the weekend. And, uh, you know, when you're getting scoring from Ramir Moore and Delani Hunt and Zaire Williams was, you know, he was business as usual, especially around the rim. Wagner, you know, they shoot 55% yesterday against Sacred Heart, and you combine that with their defense, they're close to unstoppable. And it's kind of funny, you know, it's, it's the same formula, defensive identity, timely shot making. It's like, Donald Copeland and Bashir Mason are the same head coach, no? <laughs> They've had, it looks like they will have similar success based on what we've seen so far this year. You have to remember Wagner had a terrific non-conference season, the way they stress defense, the way, of course, it's their mantra, stressing toughness. Uh, I, I always enjoy watching the Wagner teams get out on the court. I would, I would like to point out that, you know, as a, uh, I'm a, the mid-range guy. I'm the mid I'm I'm anti-analytics guy sometimes. I was a big Spurs fan all those years where they, you know, you had your Manus and your Tony Parkers who excelled in the mid-range. So that's why I love watching Ramir Moore on Sunday doing what he was doing. Um 
you know, hitting 18 footers, but also taking it to the, to the hole and he's strong and he can get buckets and they have a bunch of guys that can do that on the team. Yeah, no, you know, mid-range basketball is something that they thrived at last year with Morales and Martinez and Elijah Ford. They were great at that. And it's something that Copeland's not going to abandon for sure. You know, obviously you want, you want threes and dunks, threes and layups as much as possible, but when the opportunity presents itself, make your, make those mid-range buckets too. They're important. And uh, Wagner certainly did that on Sunday. Let's wrap our three-point shot by giving a shout out to St. Francis University. Only played once this week, but it was an impressive performance on Friday against St. Francis Brooklyn. Yeah, they jumped out to a 25-point advantage at half, and they were just scoring at will, 56% from two, 71% from three. And no, I did not misspeak there. It was 71% from three (laughs) and 73% from the line. You know, Josh Cohen had his typical 22-point performance, but the really encouraging thing for St. Francis, in my opinion, was Rennell Giles really got going. He had 16 points a season high, four of four from way downtown. And right now, St. Francis, they're now 4-0 in league play. I mean, Ron, if if you're a team and you have, you know, you have to pick a road game in the NEC tournament, is DeGaul Arena the last place you want to be? Yeah, you said 4-0 in league play, 4-0 at home in league play, to just to clarify. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yes, that would that that would be a tough place to play. I think you hit on something important there. You know, Rennell Giles finding his form is huge. He is a, an enormous X factor in this league this year. They did this on Friday without Landon Moore. So they are got they're getting contributions. Uh, up and down the lineup. Of course, Josh Cohen was was Josh Cohen in this game. He was terrific. Uh, then, yes, I, I think when it comes down to March, I'm pretty certain SFU is going to host at least one and maybe multiple home games in Degal Arena. And when that place is packed, it, it is it is a tough place to play. And um, they seem to always bring their A game in a in a year where we're struggling our home teams to win at home. They're four and zero. Yeah, no one wants to go to Loretto either deep into the winter. And uh, that certainly is a factor. You know, there's not many tough road trips anymore in the NEC, given the kind of geography construction that we've seen with the movement of teams. But it's still tough to get out to Loretto and play there. It's time now for our NEC Open Mic. And we welcome in Stonehill, fifth-year guard, Isaiah Burnett. Stonehill coming off a big road trip this past weekend. Isaiah, thanks for taking some time to talk to us. Thank you for having me. All right, so I want to get into what happened over the weekend. Um, sensational road trip culminating with a victory yesterday. We're taping this on Monday, so on Sunday, big second half from Stonehill against FDU, 51 second half points. Take me through the mindset of the team at halftime and into early in the second half. I think there was 10 straight possessions that you did not score on. Then there was the explosion, and Shamir Johnson caught fire. Um, how was the team suddenly able to reverse course in that game, gain the momentum and then keep it? Um, so basically coming into halftime, um, coach Charles was basically just talking about, uh, playing together as a family. Um, we were struggling at the end of the first half to make shots. We were turning the ball over. So going into halftime, it kind of felt like the momentum was all with Fairleigh Dickinson. So, um, coach Charles just wanted us to relax, take a breath, remember who we are, start playing who we know and how we know how we can play. Um, so to start the second half, um, it kind of game came together with us playing as a family, playing like we know how to, um, and then just hats off to Shamir Johnson. Um, we've all known how he can play, um, and he kind of showed like his whole realm of his game, not just shooting the ball, getting to the basket, and I think he was a huge and vital part to us winning that game. So with him making shots, and I think another part of the, uh, the game plan going into the halftime was we ended up playing zone um, and we wanted to kind of emphasize getting stops on the defense end. And I think all my teammates did a really good job of not only getting stops, but rebounding a ball, which is something that we've been struggling with as a team. Um, so hats off to my teammates for for helping us take that next step and keeping our attitude um, kind of in a positive direction and not not getting down on ourselves, even with being down, I think, 14 it was so. Before I turn it over to you, Ryan, for a couple of questions, do you think one thing I noticed with your team is you never seem to get rattled in these games. Do you think having this uh, very upper class laden team that you've been through some of these wars together helps you? I definitely believe that. Um, 
Coach Ross is a he does a really good job of making sure our attitudes are right. Um, we don't have any captains on our team, um, so he kind of makes it free reign for anybody, whether you play 40 minutes, whether you don't play at all, free reign to just speak up, speak your opinion. Um, and I think we do a really good job as a team of holding each other accountable. Um, and I think attitude coming into this year is something we wanted to wanted to emphasize with taking the step from D2 to D1. We knew we were going to have tough games. We we're going to have close games, hard games. But I think with the way our attitude has been um, sticking together as a family is why we're, we're seeing some success in the NEC conference in our first year. And Isaiah, you were at the Naval Academy, you know, for the 2018-19 season. Uh, we all know how much of a commitment that is to be at the Navy and balance life as a midshipman, balance life in the classroom, on the court. How did that experience shape you to become the type of person and player you are now? I would say it definitely helped with a, a leadership role because um, the Naval Academy has some of the best leaders in the world um, with a great military force. So I think understanding how those guys thought, especially in hard times, um, is a big thing because um, I'm, I'm a competitor. I struggle with my attitude sometimes. I think it's helped me grow from where I was then watching the type of military leaders at the Naval Academy and how they dealt with certain situations is definitely something that I've tried to bring to this team. Um, and I, I think it was something that we all embodied, especially in our game yesterday, because it was easy for us to kind of give in because Fairleigh Dickinson's a tremendous team. Um, and they were kind of putting it on us, especially in the first half. So we easily could have could have given up. But I think our attitude was at the right place. And I think um, leadership qualities are starting to rub off on a lot of my teammates, which has been really good to see. And you, you were at the Navy. You're from a beautiful city in Maryland. Take me through the journey. How did you end up with Coach Krause in Stonehill? So uh, when I decided to leave the Naval Academy, I just felt like the military lifestyle wasn't something I wanted to do. Um, but I had a conversation with my parents, and we both decided that I wanted to go to a good academic school first with, and leaving the Naval Academy. Um, and one of my old AAU coaches, uh, his son was actually on staff under Coach Kraus. Um, so he was the first one we hit up. And then I ended up having conversations, multiple conversations with Coach Kraus. And I ended up loving the atmosphere when I came up here to visit. Um, and then I just decided that it, it fit perfectly for me. Isaiah, I love watching you play defense. Um, is being a ball hawk, I need, you've had to steal every single game this season, at least one. Um, is being a ball hawk something that you developed over the years? Is that something you've had since you were a kid playing? I would say that's definitely something I've had since I was a little kid. Um, I, I get it from my mom when she comes to watch our game. She's she's not really like one of those parents to be talking a lot, but all she wants me to do is just steal the ball. So I can kind of hear her in the background just saying, <laughs> I can't steal the ball. Um, so that's just something that I... I kind of pride myself on the defensive end. Um, and that's another thing I love about Coach Krause that he we, he preaches defense, um, especially with our team. We have a lot of great people who can shoot the ball, Shamir, uh, Max, uh, Josh, Josh Mack. Um, so I think the defense end is just something that I, I kind of just hold for myself. So I like this is a feeling of getting a steal that I kind of just like. So I think I've always had that kind of sense. Isaiah, if you had to choose, what would you rather have, a pick six or a rejection at the rim defensively? After last night, definitely a pick six. Um, <laughs> You've had a few of them, too. You had a bunch yeah. of them, especially against Wagner. You really kind of took over that game in the second half against Wagner. I, had, I think you had like three, two or three pick sixes in the middle of that second half to really kind of help your team extend yeah. a run there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would definitely rather have a pick six. <laughs> I think my uh, blocking career days have, are, are now done. So. Oh, your, your block rate's pretty, pretty respectable, <laughs> too, for a guard. Don't sell yourself short. Don't be modest here. But, you know, one one little analytical nugget, you know, I'm, I'm big into the analytics and statistics. So something, looking at your analytics, it's kind of interesting. Out of timeouts, you've been really efficient. You're shooting 53% on 34 attempts out of timeouts this season. And that kind of puts you in the top 20 percentile of all of Division One players. I'm just curious, is that a fluky thing or is that something Coach Krause is really good at calling plays for you out of timeouts? Take me through that little analytical nugget. Uh, I'd say it's a little bit of both because um, most of the time, and especially with our offense, we run a lot of motion. Um, you rarely see us running any plays, just a free-flowing motion. That's how Coach Krause likes it. Um, 
So when he does decide to, he usually draws up plays at uh, timeouts. Um, so I think he does a great job of putting me in a position or putting uh, any of my other teammates in a great position to score the ball out of timeout. So I, I give him all the credit on that one. Um, so, yeah. Isaiah, it, preseason heading into the year, you knew you were going to be in this reclassification, Stonehill was into Division One, and that you couldn't appear in the NCAA tournament. What was the team's goal heading into your first year uh, as a program in Division One? I? I would say a goal of ours. Um, we knew we weren't going to be able to compete in playoffs or in the, the tournament. So I think a goal of ours was a regular season title, um, which is what Merrimack ended up doing their first year. And I, I felt like we we were talented enough. I feel like we we can still win the regular season. Um, and I feel like that's that's a goal that we've been talking about ever since we, we found out um, that we were moving up to D1. Um, and I think that makes every regular season game for us special because we know we only have limited games left. Um, with only being able to play in the regular season. So I feel like those regular season games mean a lot to us. And that's why that's part of the reason why that, that comeback victory we had last night was so crucial um, and felt so good because we know each re regular season is like our Super Bowl. Um, so I feel like that was our mentality coming into this year. Isaiah, what was your feeling when word trickled down to you back in the spring that Stonehill was making the move to Division One in the NEC? I was super excited. Um, I was super excited to be back at the division one level, um, especially being uh, one of the top players on this team to finally be able to play those minutes, those minutes that I maybe wanted to at Navy, but I wasn't ready there. Um, so now just from like a personal goal, being able to prove myself um, at the division one level. Um, Cause I knew all, all my teammates, um, they would always ask me like, What's the difference between Division One, Division Two? Um, and truthfully, I don't, I don't see a big difference um, at all. I think um, talent-wise, all my teammates are talented enough to play the Division One level, and I think just everyone wants to play at the Division One level. And I'm thankful that some of my teammates who have been with me, been at Stono since even I got here, now gotten the chance to even prove themselves at this level. Um, which is the three other seniors like Josh Mack, Shamir Johnson, Andrew Sims, been able to prove their talent um, and just show like people that they can play at this level. And I think they've done a tremendous job of doing that. So we're halfway through your first season, halfway home now, five and three after the first eight games, eight to go. You just said your goal and the team's goal is to win the NEC regular season title. What do you need to do the second half? Will five and three may not be good enough in the second half to get to your goal. What do you have to do to keep getting better? In my opinion, I think a big thing for us is to just uh, stay together as a family. Um, and I think that's that's a, a big thing with our team is that it on our team, it's not just one guy that's going to be the guy every night. Um, I mean, Andrew Sims, he, he's been that guy for probably most of the nights. But I think in a night where maybe Andrew Sims isn't that guy, we have a Shamir Johnson. Um, and I think our team does a great job of priding ourselves and being excited for other people doing well. Um, and I think that's a big thing and a, a big part of our team and why I think we can win this title is from the offensive side of being selfish with the ball because we play a free flowing motion. Um, so being, uh, I mean, unselfish with the ball. And then from a defensive standpoint, I think if we can continue uh, being a top team in this league, uh, it will put us in a great position to win it all. All right, there you have it. Isaiah Burnett talking about Stonehill, their goals, and, and what they're going to be doing over the next half of the season to reach that goal. Uh, Isaiah, thanks for joining Ryan and myself today. We really appreciate having you on the show. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Time for our weekly heat check. Ryan, last year we talked about Wagner, Raekwon Rogers in the middle, an offensive force. Suddenly, it looks like they found someone to pick up that slack that they may have been missing earlier in the year. Sophomore Rob Taylor has been fantastic. He's really had some great performances, but this past weekend was his best to date. 36 points on 14 of 19 shooting over the weekend. He's really solidified that five spot for Wagner. You look at Taylor and his maturation, his assortment in the post is really special. He's got that great spin move when he gets a post entry. He's really good at offensive putbacks and finishing, you know, giving Wagner much needed second chance points, especially when Wagner's not shooting the ball well. 
and uh, he runs the floor really well. He's got some good athleticism. He may be a little undersized at six, 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 seven, but that athleticism certainly plays up as well. He's, he's been a special player in his second year at Wagner. Yeah. Outstanding. We got some really good post players in this league. Let's go from the post to the point. Uh, freshman Javon Bennett at Merrimack. It's hard to believe he's only a freshman seeing what he's done defensively. One of the top five, I think he's top five in the country in steals per game. Now he's picking it up offensively as well. He's a defensive seven, you know, third in steal rate in the country at 6.3%, which is remarkable. But now his offensive game is starting to catch up to his defensive performances. And now he has back-to-back efforts in double figures after getting 13 points in Miramax win over St. Francis Brooklyn on Sunday. And in league play, you look at his numbers, they're much better now. He's got the fifth best assist rate in the league. He's also shooting 38% from three. And he's got that elite level quickness, you know, that quick first step, that ability to get downhill in a hurry. And he's just getting more and more confidence. That's a scary thing for the rest of the league. We've talked about a post presence. We've talked about a quick defensive minded point guard. Now we turn to a rebounding force as of late. Andre Snoddy on Central has been awesome the last couple of weeks. He's been amazing. The league has a lot of great rebounders, let's be honest, and a lot of great foremen. But right now, no one's playing at a better level than Andre Snoddy, who now has the league's best defensive rebounding rate in league play. He's grabbing 31% of the opponent's misses, which is quite insane. And he's coming off a 27-point, 31-rebound effort in these last two games a loss at Wagner, and then a much-needed win at LIU. He's been fantastic. He's kind of like, you know, Coach Sellers has always called him a little Draymond Green. He's got that versatility, and now he's starting to hit threes, but he could pass the ball. He could bring it up the floor for you after the defensive rebound. Um, He's got that versatility defensively. He could guard one through five if he needs to. So he's a player who's going to get better as he continues his career at Central Connecticut, and he's certainly starting to flash that ability, that ceiling of his as potentially an all-conference player as a sophomore. Rob Taylor, Javon Bennett, and Andre Snotty have been heating up. Ryan, I always love our stat chat, and today I know you're going to get deep into some analytics here. We're talking Merrimack defense. We talked about Javon Bennett and his impact on the game. Merrimack has been an impenetrable force on defense and league play this season. It's impressive because Joe Gallo, he really can teach defense so well because they've had more newcomers and returnees going into the season, but he still has his freshmen, his newcomers playing at a high level. Bennett is one of them, Jordan Durkak as well. And you look at Merrimack's defensive efficiency in league play, they're first in the league, which is no surprise, but their defensive efficiency now, which is at 89.1 adjusted for schedule, that's actually better than it was in the 2019-20 season when they had Javaris Hayes and that great defense that won them a regular season championship at 14 and four. So right now they're hitting the trifecta on defense Best turnover rate at 27% in league play. Best three-point field goal defense at 27% in league play. And they're getting a steal on 17% of the opponent's possession, Crazy. which is insane. And they're yeah. also holding, holding opponents to only 46% shooting from inside the arc. So they're just slicing teams up every which way on defense. It's quite impressive. Next up is our NEC game of the week, and we'll have a bonus game as well. But let's start with the opener of our CBS Sports Network package. This Thursday, January 26th, St. Francis, Brooklyn, at Wagner, Spiro Center, 5 p.m. Yeah, this should be a fun one. I'm really looking forward to Tedrick Wilcox, who right now leads St. Francis, Brooklyn in scoring. He's been really good of late, a really good swing man, completed 3-4 for Glenn Breka. He, he's probably going to go up against Ramir Moore, who's a really good defensive minded guard. We talked about him early in his offensive prowess, but at six, three and four, how physical he is. That's going to be a fun matchup between Wilcox and Ramir Moore. So I'm curious to see how the Brooklyn offense fares against the Wagner defense. Thursday's a big day because truly the game of the week comes at seven o'clock that same night. St. Francis University visits FDU. One versus two in the standings right now. This is one we've all been looking forward to the last few weeks. Yeah, 100%. You know, St. Francis loves to play in the half court. When, why not? You have the best post presence in the league in Josh Cohen. But FDU likes to really get up and down the floor. So I'm going to be curious to see how the tempo is in this one. And we have the two best 
offenses in the league in terms of offense efficiency. FDU is kind of far and away above, but St. Francis has really kind of hit their stride of late. They're making threes. We mentioned their performance earlier in the week against St. Francis Brooklyn. And it's just going to be a fun, uh, hopefully a shootout. I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe, uh, you know, an 85 to 80 final where teams are, blow, are you throwing offensive blows at each other. And we got Josh Cohen against, you know, Dimitri Roberts and Grant Singleton and Rennell Giles gets going. And then you have, you know, Almanor making some shots. It should be a fun one. There always seems to be great games going on at uh, Stratus Arena. Remember last year's CBS game with FDU and Wagner. This past weekend, FDU had two unbelievably fun games uh, against Sacred Heart and then Stonehill. Pivotal stretch here for the Flash, four in a row on the road. We'll see where that leads them. Looking forward to that game. Uh, as always, if you can't make it to the games, you can watch all NEC Hoops action on necfrontrow.com or the NEC on the Run series of mobile apps. Ryan, we just completed our tour of NEC Hoops for the week. Another great show. It was a pleasure again, Ron. It's, we're now into the teeth of the league. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned before, our contenders are really starting to emerge. So I'm really looking forward to see these teams jockeying for home court advantage in the NEC tournament come uh, March. Thanks to Isaiah Burnett for joining us from Stonehill. And we will be back next week with another episode of NEC on the Run.